Okay, so thanks so much for for the for your time. I know it took us a while to collaborate um, and plan for this conversation. I was thinking why why I'm talking with you about this article, which we wanna, we will we'll tell people what article this is, and I want you to basically explain everything. But um, first of all, can you tell us what this article is about in like one or two minutes? And also tell us why you are a qualified person to talk about this article and explain it to me and everyone who is interested in the topic of endometriosis and cancers and everything related to that. Sure. Well, the article paper made a bigger slash splash than usual because it came out in JAMA, which obviously is wide read and gets uh, distributed to uh, lay public and so forth, as opposed to a lot of the previous publications, which get published in the Journal of Siberian Epidemiology or whatever, and it's it's not as um, readily available. So what this article uh, is about is talking about the endometriosis relationship to ovarian cancer. And as part of that, they got into a little bit more depth than the previous articles about what type of endometriosis, what type of ovarian cancer, and so forth. But it is an, essentially an observational study, epidemiologic study, so it's not a randomized controlled trial. That would take hundreds of thousands of people and decades to complete. Uh, so we probably will never see that. But what this article didn't do is bring something new to the table. What it did do is kind of reinforce the fact that there's something going on here. Um, the exact numbers, the exact details are still uh, yet to be determined, but there's previous epidemiologic observational animal studies, molecular studies that show the relationship between endo and ovarian cancer. But at the same time, uh, it's not something that is a red flag. It's something that we've, again, known about for a while, and this adds to the information. And we'll be talking about how that's the case with the questions that were asked and so forth. I'm a gynecologic oncologist who specializes uh, in endometriosis and endometriosis transformation into cancer. So I've been working on this for actually quite a while, both clinically, because I take care of clear cell cancer patients, uh, as well as endometriosis patients. Um, and we study a lot of the molecular background for this in our translational labs. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, that's what it is as to how I'm uh, uh, involved in this. Perfect. So that's exactly why we chose you to discuss this topic, because I think you are, as far as I know, you are the only uh, vetted surgeon and endometriosis excision specialist who is also subspecialized in oncology, which is cancer. So you have a, we have vast knowledge of both sides of the spectrum, and that has been your focus, endometriosis and its transformation into cancer. So that's exactly what we picked you, but uh, I wanted you to to say it so people would hear it from your part. And thanks so much for for your uh, presence in this podcast. Uh, let's dive into the topic. So you mentioned that the article didn't bring anything new, but it reinforced other stuff that was already, which I, I agree, you have written a lot of articles and books on it. So I know that for a fact. Uh, one thing that stood out to me, however, uh, was that it talked about typology of endometriosis. So first, I have to tell you an audience that I'm going to just have some introductory uh, questions with Dr. Vasilev. Then we have collected a lot of questions from the patients in the community. We told them we are going to have this interview. What's your question? So now... Then we are going to ask those questions for you. And at the end, we'll just dive deeper into some specific topics and you can mention whatever. So that this will be the, the anatomy and timeline of this conversation. But uh, so typology, what, was, was there an evidence in the past even about the typology of the endometriosis and its relationship to cancers? Or for, even for, if for me, this was a new part of the whole article. But I, I, I'm wondering what's your opinion. Was this new or you already knew that some types of endo would be actually more uh, 
relevant to cancer, to future cancer pre- prevalence or incidence? Yeah, well, this did add uh, a little bit of information along those lines, but we did know already that the more aggressive variants, if you will, of endo, like deep infiltrating, um, and it's hard to tease out endometrioma type because it's usually affiliated with deep infiltrating, but the more disease there is, the more aggressive it is. We knew on a molecular basis that uh, there's something going on with relationship to cancer. Um, and that has been demonstrated in, in previous papers. Like I said, sometimes published in obscure areas to where it really wasn't brought to light very much. Uh, but this shed light on a more epidemiologic level. So clinically, I mean, which cancer is related to what type of a, of a uh, endometriosis picture? So again, superficial is the most common, probably the least risk factor. Uh, although it's still elevated, uh, but is much less elevated than with an endometrioma or deep infiltrating. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more, I think, in the questions, but there's molecular um, science overlap to where mm-hmm. for a while now, those that research d- disease have been saying that endometriosis in some cases is a precancerous disease, no question about it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So um, I was really fascinated. I, I want to know more about your opinions about the style, the structure of the article, the structure of the study, its limitations, but we'll get to that. If uh, Maybe the best uh, thing would be let's dive into patients' questions first, and then from the questions we can you know, have more branches and dive into related topics when you are living. So I want to make sure, make sure, make sure that Patients' questions are answered properly here in this conversation uh, when we are talking. So one of the patients asked uh, how to know if we are at risk. You already touched upon it, but can you can you open this up for us? Sure. Um, before we go there, just the one other thing I want to say is that, you know, obviously we don't know the cause for endometriosis. So we call it polygenic, meaning a lot of genes are involved, and multifactorial, which means environmental factors, et cetera. When you have a disease like that, and then you're trying to associate it and see what the causative factors, et cetera, with other diseases, it makes it even more of a quagmire and difficult to tell what fits mm-hmm. with what. So again, just to be clear on that front, it's uh, these all these papers are pointing to issues, but it's more of yellow flags. And uh, as we're about to talk about, um, in some cases, patients are at more risk than others. So as a background, and this, again, you know, when you're talking about endometriosis with someone, you don't come out and the very first thing you talk about is cancer. You're talking about the fertility issues. You're talking about the pain factors. To load on top of that cancer risk can be overwhelming sometimes. So you have to be judicious about who you raise that with and who not. But as a background, remember that if you are a woman, you are at risk for ovarian cancer. And that risk is somewhere between one and one and a half percent lifetime with most of those cancers developing when you're in your 60s. So a little bit further down the line, there are other types that uh, happen earlier. Uh, <clears throat> but basically that increases a lot when you have a family history, especially a uh, first degree like sisters or mom, that and all of a sudden it's not 1.5% anymore, it's about 5%, so already elevated. If you're tested and you have a BRCA mutation or Angelina Jolie gene, that some people still call it, or some other lower variants, your risk can go as high as 60% lifetime. So it's a graded increase depending on, again, just background, um, family history, uh, genetic uh, testing and findings. And then on top of that, there's the fact that this uh, cause or at least association has been pointed to with endometriosis. Uh, It's not like you end up adding all of this up and you end up with somebody who's going to end up with 100% risk or anything like that. Um, And the biggest factor probably is the genetic side. So in other words, if you 
have a family history probably ought to be tested because it definitely uh, fits in there. But let's just say you don't have anybody in the family history. Um, and by the way, this paper didn't really address the relationship with genetics and family history. It did a lot and it, it really covered quite a few bases, but it didn't really interface with the genetic risk side of things. So um, if you take away the genetics part of it and you take away the family history part of it, that's where this typology factor came in. And they pointed to the fact that when you are uh, have superficial endometriosis, which is the most common type, the kind of, if you will, earlier endometriosis, which covers a lot of area, maybe causing a lot of discomfort and pain, but it does not go deep and deep infiltrating, which is the next one, I suppose, up. Uh, previously defined as anything five millimeters or deeper, uh, kind of going into the peritoneum and retroperitoneum. That's kind of being debated at this point. But something that clearly is a little more aggressive. It's growing more aggressively and invading tissues, right? Uh, and then endometriomas, which um, you can talk about what the causation of that is in and of itself. It's a, it's a big factor by itself, but both the deep infiltrating endometrioma suggest more aggressive endometriosis, basically. So that is where uh, they stratified the risk um, of anywhere really on the low side of somewhere between two and 3% higher risk, all the way up to almost 19 times the risk uh, between these types of endometriosis and also the types of ovarian cancer. There's two different types uh, or two different categories for ovarian cancer, actually, type one and type two. So the type two is what most people hear about and is more common. Um, it's the more aggressive one where you hear about people having ascites and major problems with ovarian cancer, chemotherapy, et cetera. That is elevated with this endometriosis uh, association, but it is mostly the type one or the, what people hear about mostly as clear cell cancer and endometrioid type cancer, but also low grade mucinous cancers. All of those actually, the good news is they tend to be found at a lower stage up front. Um, but unfortunately, the clear cell type can be very aggressive and maybe because it sits there for a while until it has mm -hmm. been properly diagnosed uh, and removed, uh, we really don't know. In some cases though, clear cell can be rather indolent or not very fast uh, growing, but in other cases it can be very, very difficult to control because, um, and I, we'll talk about this a little bit more later also, but chemotherapy doesn't really work against it very well. So you have to kind of hope that you end up with a early stage when you diagnose it. So the more you're thinking about this uh, as a possibility, uh, the more you know you have the right consultants that talk uh, to you, and then you hopefully find it in stage one rather than more advanced uh, stages. So. so um, I think the, the other good news is that, again, the, the prognosis for type 1 is better except for the clear cell type. So uh, that and the early stage. So let me, I want to, so help me understand. If so, obviously, the question was how to know if you are at risk. Obviously, if you have endo, you are at risk. If your endo is more advanced, you are at more risk. Or, if, for example, if you have deep endometriosis or endometrioma, you are at higher risk. And if you have superficial endo, you are at lower risk. So, but endo means risk, obviously. But question, there is a debate that if you leave a superficial endometriosis for long enough, it will become a deep infiltrative endometriosis situation. First, do you confirm this or there is no evidence still? If you confirm this, then can we conclude when you leave an endometriosis, superficial endometriosis untreated, you are actually increasing the risk of cancer by letting it become more deep and more advanced? Yeah, so the, the cautionary statement is here. People shouldn't uh, panic because, you know, oh, my God, we're, you know, leaving this alone too long. It, it may develop in the cancer next week and, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in trouble in two months from now. 
it's not quite that rapid and that uh, much of an association. Again, with the type ones, they tend to be a little bit um, less mm -hmm. aggressive. Having said that, um, yes, we know that endometriosis has a progression of sorts. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it under a microscope, just mm -hmm. the endo, uh, you have kind of regular looking endometriosis and then there are innuendos in both the stroma or the underlying tissue and the epithelium, which is the upper glandular part of the endometriosis to where it looks kind of normal-ish. Mm -hmm. uh, again, molecularly, it's way different from what's growing inside the endometrial mm -hmm. cavity inside the uterus, but still looks kind of normal, right? Uh, as opposed to when it becomes atypical, when it starts mm -hmm. looking uglier and then eventually transitioning mm -hmm. to um, a more of what people would say is precancerous and then cancerous. So there is a progression. The question is, what exactly is going on? And again, when you're limited by not knowing exactly the factors that cause endo and each type of endo, mm -hmm. I don't think that it's um, proven beyond the shadow of a doubt, but it is logical to assume that in many cases, there's going to be a progression from superficial to a deeper mm -hmm. infiltrating, et cetera. But again, the, the, the data is not absolutely crystal clear on that. There are a whole lot of molecular abnormalities that you have to really follow to understand whether or not this is pre-malignant or if it's going to be endo forever. Um, and that's not clearly defined yet. Okay, so based on this article's data, I just state some some numbers based on the article. It's not a question just to add up to what you just mentioned. Uh, if you have a deep infiltrative endometriosis or ovarian endometrioma, the risk is nine point sixty six uh, is for for developing ovarian cancer. And if you have superficial, the hazard ratio is basically adjusted hazard ratio. But if you have superficial endometrioma, the risk is 2.82-fold, basically compared to the uh, people without diagnosis. So in some sense, it increases the chance by almost 3x if you go from superficial to deep, which shows the importance of having the right diagnosis and treatment as early as possible in a person's lifestyle, in a person's lifespan. Okay, so with that, um, I'm going to go into the next question, which was a, a very interesting question. And the question was, how is endometriosis related to luteinizing unruptured follicle syndrome and any updated research about how to treat this? So uh, <clears throat> the caveat here is that I am not an expert on the infertility side, and this is primarily a type of infertility uh, issue, LUFS, um, but it is related to follicles not uh, bursting like they normally do in, in uh, conception, basically, and normal cycles, actually, during periods, right? One of the theories of some of the types of ovarian cancer is that the more follicles break through the surface of the ovary and the more you end up with uh, trauma to the surface of the ovary, the more your risk of ovarian cancer goes up. Um, that's not the only reason that now that we know of ovarian cancer, but actually in particular for the type ones that we're talking about, that may be a major factor. And then there are molecular changes, inflammation, et cetera, that happens that leads to cancer. So that's one of the reasons that birth control pills actually reduce the risk of ovarian cancer and that you make the surface of the ovary quieter, meaning less um, ovulations per lifetime. Uh, or if you're pregnant with multiple kids, that means many, many, many months where you're not ovulating. And so from a lefts to cancer perspective, and this is just, honestly, I'm just throwing out a theory there. Uh, this has not been investigated to any extent on that front, but it actually may be something that um, reduces your risk of ovarian cancer rather than uh, increasing it. But specifically talking about lefts and infertility, that's out of my lane. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, and LOVS stands for luteinizing unruptured follicle syndrome, just um, in case someone is wondering. Okay. So, um, I understand that um, you're not an 
in that field, but I think um, the answer was clear. So now uh, there's a question about cancer symptoms versus endo symptoms. I think this is a terrifying situation for almost every patient and provider. But what tips do you have for identifying cancer symptoms versus endo symptoms? If you can give us a backdrop, then explain like what tips you have in general for, for doctors and, and patients who are listening to this. Sure. And the, again, the caveat to this is that we all, all of us, uh, you know, have a symptom and then we look it up on the internet and it says this could be cancer and then we're all terrified and it could be other things, brain cancer, whatever. Uh, we just, <laughs> you know, self-implode uh, trying to be uh, to doctor ourselves and even doctors that are outside of their specialty. So there's a crossover and that's part of the reason that, uh, there's such a delay in diagnosis of endometriosis too, that you go specialist to specialist to specialist, and they're looking at you from their lens and so forth. Mm -hmm. On top of that, there is the overlap of symptoms. And it is true that, for example, with ovarian cancer, bloating is one of the symptoms. It's usually a later symptom of ovarian cancer. And usually with ovarian cancer, you don't really have pain until later on when you have a lot of disease. And it's certainly not, um, in most cases, not cyclic as you can find in endometriosis or adenomyosis. So um, the bloating that happens with endobelly, uh, of course, there are of course, uh, enough inflammation in some people to have endobelly all the time. Uh, but it can usually at least get worse and abate a little bit with cycles. And that usually speak against uh, ovarian cancer and more towards uh, endometriosis. Mm -hmm. But other symptoms like pelvic pressure, for example, when you have an endometrioma versus an ovarian mass from a tumor, tumors, by the way, can be benign or malignant, or what we call low malignant potential or in-between tumors, which are part of this discussion of the type 1 ovarian cancers. But Basically, a mass that occupies space in the pelvis can press on the bladder, could press on the rectum, um, so it can cause um, symptoms, urinary symptoms. It can cause um, constipation, for example, mm -hmm. diarrhea. Those kind of overlap uh, between ovarian um, and uh, cancer and endometriosis. But again, probably the biggest discriminator is the pain. I mean, if it's a cyclic type pain, and any symptom that kind of comes and goes with, uh, with cycles is more likely to be endo uh, or adenomyosis as opposed to uh, cancer. Mm -hmm. Abnormal bleeding can occur with either because, um, well, obviously, in the endometriosis, adenomyosis, uh, everybody's keenly aware of that. In ovarian cancer, again, it can disrupt um, the normal uh, ovulation, you end up with uh, also abnormal bleeding, but not as much of a, uh, not as much of a situation. Mm -hmm. In general, uh, you know, the, the older you are and the more persistent the symptom is and less cyclic it is, the more you should get a consult to see if something else may be going on. Okay. When you were mentioning this, um, I was thinking, Especially because ovarian cancer, we can we mostly diagnose them when they are pretty advanced stage because of its anatomy and the things that uh, is around it. It's not like it doesn't show up immediately in our lifetime. So, in our uh, daily life, and uh, and this uh, study is uh, and and I mean and you mentioned that ovarian cancer is more advanced age and endometriosis is actually the younger side. So there's probably a gap between when the endometriosis occur and when it re it leads to a cancer if it leads actually that we just only have a observational study but maybe we have to in the future have a study about like the risk increase per decade or per five years like if i have endometriosis now in 5 10 20 years what's the risk of developing ovarian cancer um so that's it just it was unrelated to this question, but uh, it just occurred to me that actually could be something to think about in the future for future studies. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, remember inflammation is a key part of any cancerogenesis type of situation, no matter where it is. So, and what is endo? Very inflammatory. 
So uh, the more you have inflammation for a long time, the more there's definitely going to be an increased risk. Um, but you know, what you're talking about looking at the, the details of that, that's going to require some more research. Yeah. yeah. Talking about inflammation and which is a common den uh, denominator for endometriosis and cancer and other diseases, but these two specifically. So we know, so the best treatment that we have for endometriosis is excision of endometriosis done by a true expert. Why we say it's important to do it by a true expert? Because a true expert can go in and take as much endometriosis lesion as possible out because we want nothing left in the body to cause inflammation and all the issues. Now, there is a question that if someone, if you remove your, over, your fallopian tubes, does it decrease the risk in the context of endometriosis? Probably the fallopians have been removed because of the endo lesions. So uh, what, what's your uh, idea? What's your opinion on this question? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of sub uh, topics in here. But in general, remember I talked about type 1, type 2. And again, the association with endo is mostly type 1 ovarian cancers. But type 2 ovarian cancers uh, have a likelihood of most of the pre-malignant changes being in the fallopian tubes. We know that really relatively recent studies. Before that, we just thought it was the incessant ovulation that I was talking about a little earlier for all of those. And to some extent, that's true. But with type 2, uh, it is uh, highly uh, related to the fallopian tube and pre-malignant lesions that develop there. When you take out fallopian tubes in, um, in any situation, it will prevent type 2 ovarian cancer rather well. And in fact, the American College of OBGYN uh, recommends um, what they call opportunistic um, salpingectomy, which means that never mind the endo, if you're operating on any woman who has says she's done with fertility, uh, you should consider taking out uh, the fallopian tubes to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer happening. There's some innuendos here, depending on whether you are BRCA positive or not, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But in general, that's the recommendation, take out the tubes. That does have a bearing on endo patients uh, because of the discussion of, well, are we gonna, because the REI may say, well, you should at least clip the tubes for better implantation in the uterus and less of that fluid that's in a blocked tube um, and so forth. Uh, but that doesn't reduce the risk of cancer. So it really, rather than clipping, you should actually consider taking the fallopian mm -hmm. tube out. Um, so that is an issue uh, and specific to endo and the type mm -hmm. 2 ovarian cancer, which again, there is an increased risk of type 2 with endo as well. But for the type 1, mm -hmm. uh, it does decrease the risk of type 1 ovarian cancer as well just not as much. Um, and we don't know the details of that because people, well, again, because we've only relatively recently learned that the fallopian tubes have a different role in the type one versus type two ovarian cancers, but it does decrease type one as well. So removing the uh, fallopian tubes for both uh, is a risk preventative. Um, and uh, again, the other ones being, I have to mention uh, multiple times that oral contraceptives, even though they've been demonized over the years, uh, do decrease ovarian cancer. They're, I mean, that's they probably saved conservative estimates or at least half a million lives over the years um, and possibly more because they quiet down the ovarian surface. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, self-injectomy is definitely a um, strategy and it does decrease the risk. Okay. And self-injectomy means removing the ovaries for people who might not be. So, so regardless of the context, if it's endo not, not or not. Removing the, not removing the ovaries, removing the tubes. I am so sorry. Yes. <laughs> self-injectomy means removing the fallopian tubes. So basically in any humans removing uh, uh, tubes can can reduce the risk of cancers, but then endo also has similar impact. So um, 
plus removing the endometriosis, which has that inflammation. So, yes, the answer basically is, does, it rec- does, does removing the fallopian tubes re- decrease the risk? So the answer is yes, based on the data in the past. Okay. So the next question is, it's a very tricky question, actually. And um, so some patient has had a surgery for a stage four deep endometriosis, and uh, she also has had endometrioma. Now she's asking what blood test can she do for a screening? So, uh, yeah, that is a very tricky question because the blood tests that uh, are done for ovarian cancer um, overlap with endometriosis. So the biggest one that uh, overlaps that you hear about is CA-125. Um, That was designed to not be a screening tool for ovarian cancer, but rather to um, see what the progress is in someone who we know has ovarian cancer because it will either be going up, meaning the treatment isn't working, whatever it is, or it's going down, meaning the treatment is working. Not all ovarian cancers, by the way, produce CA-125, but endometriosis also produces CA-125, and it's related to the fact that inflammatory changes uh, make CA-125 occur in in the bloodstream. There are other tumor markers like CEA and CA199. It's kind of a word soup, basically HE4. All of them can be looked at, um, but they are not specific for, frankly, either endo or ovarian cancer. On the other hand, um, possibly somebody may have gotten that uh, test, and then what do you do with it? You should at least follow it to make sure it goes down to normal or if it stays stable, because in endo, even though there's no cancer, it can bounce around in an abnormal area. Mm -hmm. But the key term is that it bounces around. Not a very medical term, but the point is if there's no trend that goes up, Mm -hmm. then you're probably relatively safe that it's not a cancer-related production of these tumor markers. Uh, The other testing, though, that we haven't really talked about in detail here is it's not really a it can be a blood test, but it goes beyond that, uh, is that if you have a, again, a family history, uh, you should be thinking about genetic testing. And that's a whole different set of tests, but that will give you the risk of uh, you potentially having an ovarian cancer developing or not. Uh, so you know, in someone who in particular has, uh, and we're moving towards a situation parenthetically just a sidebar, is that everybody's going to get genetic testing. That's the way the world is going. But today, with the resources available, et cetera, at the very least, if you have a family history, even if it's um, remote, meaning your you know, brother, sister, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily just first generation, should at least talk to a genetics counselor. And it's not just ovarian cancer, not just the history of breast cancer, but for example, in your brother's uh, prostate cancer and some others, which can lead you to have an abnormality that uh, may not have expressed itself. So genetic counseling and determining if you need genetic testing is a a good idea. Mm -hmm. We're on the brink of other molecular uh, biomarker tests like methylation tests, some of this is being sold in the um, alternative market as being a marker for endo versus mm-hmm. cancer, et cetera. It's not, not ready for prime time yet, but it's headed in the right direction in that tools like that are uh, being researched. Mm-hmm. There's a particular type of um, mutation called ARID1A, mm-hmm. uh, which is a very common, it's similar to BRCA. Uh, It's a tumor suppressor uh, gene, which is found in endometriosis without cancer and in cancer. So it's one of those overlapping things as to where we know there's a molecular relationship. That will be something that we'll probably be able to be tested for today. It's not really available as a blood test. Um, But um, Again, to kind of sum it up, if you had markers drawn and they were abnormal, make sure they follow them and make sure they go down or at least don't go up. Mm 
Um, and uh, the rest of it is really, uh, well, the genetics testing, as I mentioned, and probably follow the endometriomas. That, that those are prone to recur. So if the sooner they recur, the more there may be signs of some kind of aggressiveness there. Uh, so with repeat ultrasounds, but there's really no great blood test to bluntly answer that question. Isn't that, isn't that really wild? Like, for example, for prostate cancers, which is male specific, we have PSA, which is a good a biomarker. It's not 100% accurate, of course. But, um, you know, we, we probably need something for, for ovaries, ovarian cancer specifically. Like, yeah. this is a really important question. It is. But on the other hand, remember, even with PSA, about... 20 years ago, um, when people were really focused on PSA, maybe, or I'm not a urologist, but generally the PSA was elevated. You need a prostatectomy. So men yeah. had a gazillion prostatectomies for mm -hmm. no good reason, because today, depending on uh, something called a Gleason score, they follow uh, men with prostate mm -hmm. cancer and see where the PSA is going. And it's not mm -hmm. an immediate radical, you know, surgical approach, basically. CA-125, similarly, was overused as a screening tool. And we the reason that it's not recommended as a screening tool, as opposed to just following patients that we know have cancer, is that um, women have died uh, because of inappropriate surgery and complications and et cetera, when the CA-125 was elevated, but falsely elevated. CA-125 can be elevated for something as simple as a bad migraine. So uh, it's just not specific and sensitive enough to be a good tool. Having said that, I think the answer is going to be in the molecular markers, biomarkers that we are now at. CA-125 and PSA, for that matter, they're rather crude tools of just um, oligosaccharides that kind of float around in your bloodstream that are produced by either inflammation or cancer, and you can pick up on them, right? Mm -hmm. the molecular markers uh, are a whole different story, way more sensitive. The question is, are they specific enough? And that's where we're uh, headed, because again, we don't want to go down the road of over um, over treating people who don't need uh, treatment uh, by false positive basically okay perfect makes perfect sense to me so this next question is is actually another wild question which i think hits really deep for many many patients so we know endometrioma is by nature a recurring situation unless you remove the ovaries right because because of many uh molecular factors and like uh small microscopic lesions not being removed because no one sees them. So it's, a, it's, a, it's the nature of the disease. So this patient says whenever she goes to the hospital for endometrioma, they also test her for ovarian cancer, which probably is going to be a very common situation knowing the nature of the endometrioma as a, as a disease. What's your thought? What's your thought on this? First of all, like probably there's so many things to talk about, unpack here. So let us know how you think about this and what's your what's your recommendation if there is any recommendation other than doing screening for cancer. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, I have to back up with what we just said is that there are no tools that are particularly good for testing for uh, cancer. And everything is conjecture until you biopsy it uh, with uh, mm -hmm. surgery, basically, or sometimes a needle biopsy. But um, basically, my question would be uh, to the uh, people who are doing the testing is uh, what their background is, because they can't just be getting a CA-125 and saying you're okay if it's normal. So you really need to be um, working with an expert <laughs> in both endometriosis and cancer to be able to do the correct mm -hmm. testing, if you will. What I mean by that is there's a bit of a gray area. So for example, patients who are Ashkenazi Jewish and which high risk for ovarian cancer, and maybe they have a, a mutation 
Uh, even though we tend to say, well, you know, you really don't need to do screening because it doesn't seem to improve a length of life, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Almost all of those patients end up on some kind of a screening program that's a little bit more than just call us when you have problems. And usually that's periodic ultrasounds like every six months or so, and usually CA-125 in a targeted situation, meaning you're really, really at high risk. We should do something. We don't have the best tool, but we should do something. And so the, in the end, that type of testing is done um, for people at high risk. Uh, but just keep in mind that, uh, you know, they can't come back to you and say, well, CA-125 is normal. You're in the clear. That's not true. It's just partially true. And it's certainly better than the alternative. But make sure that you have the right um, team in place. Okay. Awesome. So the next question is, um, you, you probably talked about this initially, but I think this is a really good question in terms of clear, a uh, clear cut answer to many patients out there. And that's how do you know your endometriosis typology as a patient? So you can suspect your typology by ultrasound or MRI. Uh, so, mm. <coughs> excuse me, for example, Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you here. Can you explain what is the typology actually? Like what are yeah. the types of endometriosis? Yeah, let me let me just uh, lead into that. Uh, okay. So again, what I was trying to say with imaging, you can suspect, but the only way you can find out is by surgery. So, but for example, if you have a MRI and it shows you an endometrioma is highly likely then you at least have endometrioma type. But otherwise, in order to know for sure, uh, it's surgery. And then when surgery happens, the surgeon will remove the endo in the correct places, wh wherever it is, uh, and then uh, find out if it's superficial or if it's deeply invasive. And certainly they will see if there's an endometrioma and that's either removed or there is no endometrioma to remove. So it's either the typology is surgically determined as either being superficial spreading. Again, it may be coating a large amount of surface, uh, but it's not deeply invading. Number two would be the endometrioma type where you literally have these uh, chocolate cysts or endometriomas growing in and on the ovaries. And number three is where uh, potentially that superficial stuff grows deeper into the peritoneum and retroperitoneum and certainly anything that's beyond a few millimeters, five millimeters has been the traditional cutoff. But uh, again, being debated as to the exact um, details of that, but it's invasive and five millimeters, not that much. Sometimes we have deep infiltrating that's uh, mm -hmm. centimeters deep, uh, especially if it's going down towards maybe the sciatic nerve or and so forth. So uh, that's the um, third type. And then they mentioned this uh, other category of other. Endo can go anywhere. Um, so it can go to, it's rare, but for example, it can even go to the brain. Uh, but it can certainly go in, inside the liver, inside the spleen, um, which is, again, a very interesting point in this um, discussion about cancer versus endo. Generally speaking, when something goes from one area to another and not by direct extension, it's called a metastasis. And that's very common in cancer. But how does endometriosis, a benign condition, metastasize to other areas inside organs like the liver or spleen, et cetera? So there's a lot of molecular things that are in play here, again, that are overlapping between um, cancer molecular biology and uh, endometriosis molecular biology. Um, so most of the typology associations they made that made a whole lot of sense and there were probably enough numbers to make a statement about are really the, the, the three first ones, the superficial growth, the endometrioma type or the deep infiltrating type. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I don't think I've ever operated on anybody short of having a tiny endometrioma where endometrioma is the only disease they have. 
usually when you have endometrioma, you have something else going on and often as deep infiltrating disease if it's been there for a while, uh, but not always. Um, anyway, there is overlap here, uh, but the endometrioma type and the uh, deep infiltrating are the two that are most often associated with higher risk of, uh, of cancer. Okay. And for this specific article, I think they had five groups of typologies. One was superficial, one was deep, one was ovarian, one uh, endometrioma. Fourth group was deep plus endometrioma, and fifth group was others. Just to say what was in the article, I think the art you mentioned you did open it up in a lot more details. So. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's good to clarify that as, as, with respect to this paper. Um, but I would caution against um, reading into too much about exactly what typology is exactly what percent risk increase, mm -hmm. et cetera. That's where uh, we really don't know. What we have here is a paper which has mm -hmm. shed more light on the bigger picture that, hey, there's an association here and we can't just turn a blind eye. It's not where you have to go scaring a bunch of people because some people are higher risk than others by nature of some of the things we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you can't just say nothing to see here. There is an association and we are learning more and more about it. Okay, perfect. So the next, uh, Patient, we were talking about endometriomas for a couple of minutes. Now the next question is exactly about endometrioma surgery. And this person has, has had three endometrioma surgery. And what's the risk of ovarian cancer after these three endometrioma surgeries? So I'm not aware of uh, any data that says if you have X many that you're going to have an increased risk. I don't think this paper really, it really didn't address that. Uh, and I don't think there are any other papers that really address that very well either. Mm -hmm. um, but the more rapidly an endometrioma recurs, uh, absent potentially things like bleeding disorders where you may have um, Corpus, uh, basically normal hemorrhagic cysts persisting because there's bleeding into them that's going on mm -hmm. and you have endometriosis anyway, you may have um, an increased risk of it recurring sooner uh, than later. But absent those clotting disorders, basically if an endometrioma is recurring or endometriomas are recurring, and parenthetically, Sayed, you touched upon this a little bit earlier. It's not like they're recurring. It's another area in the ovary that may have been microscopic that's mm -hmm. turning now into an endometrioma. It's right next to it. Couldn't see it before mm -hmm. with scans or the eye, et cetera, but now it's developing into endometrioma. The more rapidly those keep coming, though, the more you have to be wondering, uh, is something else going on? Uh, and again, the median recurrence, I mean, but... Somewhere around 20%, maybe even higher, occur at two years and up to 60% at five years or so. If you're having recurrences at eight months or, or nine months or a year even or something like that, uh, it really ought to be looked at a little more carefully. How do you do that? Well, a good imaging um, with either ultrasound or MRI should be able to tell whether it's a typical looking endometrioma or if it's a atypical looking endometrioma, meaning there's more solid components in it to where, mm -hmm. um, and there's more to it than that, but basically uh, higher risk for it being a tumor uh, rather than a recurring endometrioma. Because there is this competing guideline out there that says, well, you have an endometrioma, it's less than four centimeters, we could probably just watch it for a while. That's fine from an endometrio pure endometrioma perspective and fertility, et cetera, unless it doesn't look normal. It doesn't look like a typical endometrioma or if it's coming back rather rapidly because um, the only other potential and less likely but happens is if you did not have an expert excision and somebody drained an endometrioma or drilled it or whatever term you want to use it, anything short of excising the endometrioma, which is not always 
hundred percent easy to do because they fracture and the tissue doesn't all come out. But most of the time, an expert excision surgeon can remove um, the entire endometrioma. So again, if it's coming back rather rapidly, um, probably ought to get the imaging done. And again, if you have a family history, get genetics counseling uh, and uh, family history of cancer, that is. There's, of course, family history of endometriosis as well, um, which increases your risk of endometriosis. But I'm talking about the risk of... Uh, family history of cancer per se. Okay. Awesome. So the last, the last question is, um, is a person, not the last question, uh, the one before the last question, this patient says, this is me right now, clear cell ovarian cancer from endometrioma. When will this be taken seriously? What about the screening? Well, I, you know, I, I feel the pain having taken care of uh, the clear cell patients uh, out there. It's mostly at this point, I think, awareness raising of both uh, patients as well as physicians out there. And again, a lot of these publications before were published in the Journal of Elsewhere, and you just, it just didn't come to much attention. And whenever they were raised, <clears throat> um, people kind of soft peddled it like, well, it's only a little increased risk. Um, but the fact is that there are people that are unfortunately suffering the, um, the consequences of that. Uh, my strong opinion is that the endo treatment community, as well as those who, and partly due to ignorance that I talked about, just not reading or being aware of the papers, but also those who publish on endometriosis information, including major universities that deal with uh, cancer as well as endometriosis did and are still doing a big disservice to patients by not raising this awareness. So again, there's a, there's a fine line between over scaring patients and, you know, making them completely oblivious to the fact that this is possible. So a, a healthy dose of kind of knowing the background risk, depending on where you are in your journey is important. Um, the risk is not likely high in patients who are, um, who are relatively low risk, meaning no family history and no genetic abnormalities, um, don't have deep infiltrating endometriosis, uh, um, maybe not perimenopausal or postmenopausal maybe have not had endo for several decades because it was just late in diagnosis. Uh, so the average person with probably superficial endometriosis as the, this paper stipulates as well, not that much of a higher risk, right? But it does actually, um, you have to be aware of these. And if you are aware of these high risk categories, then you should be pursuing that to kind of avoid this, um, uh, situation. And, you know, this is why I, as an oncologist, am involved in endometriosis, basically, as I kind of mentioned uh, up front. I mean, do an oncologist get pulled into cases like this to assist their colleagues that are excision surgeons when it gets beyond the capabilities of even an excision surgeon when multiple loops of bowel and rectum and maybe liver and diaphragm are involved, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's one thing. But in addition to that, we're talking about a couple things. Number one is oncologists are trained to remove um, everything radically. That doesn't always take fertility into account. Uh, so what you have to be doing really is uh, radical surgery while trying to preserve fertility while being aware of these mm -hmm. things like ovarian cancer potentially happening. So these are all competing things and you have to be making decisions preoperatively, which means appropriate consultation uh, and intraoperatively uh, to, to notice that something needs to have a frozen section done, for example, to potentially get um, the surgery moving from just excision to what we call cytoreductive surgery, which is a, the next level up which means in endo, it's you know, nice to be able to remove everything you can see because it's going to improve your quality of life and fertility. In cancer, it becomes 
almost a superlative, the um, ability to survive the cancer goes up exponentially with every little bit of cancer that you can remove. So basically, I, I've done a lot of robotic surgery myself and have done a lot and still do ovarian site reduction as well robotically. So anyway, that, that overlap is, is very um, important to, uh, to consider here in, in having the right team available, right? Um, and in addition to that, obviously, there's a whole lot going on on the uh, molecular side and mm -hmm. We're fortunate to have a translational lab to work at the molecular side as well. But um, basically, the um, the treatment for a clear cell to kind of finish out this thought after the prelude, if you will, uh, is a conundrum by itself. Because even though, as I said, sometimes you can find these in early stage, if clear cell gets away from you, um, it does not respond as well to chemotherapy of the standard type that you use for ovarian cancer of the more common varieties, right? Uh, very big problem um, in that all, in something called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCM guidelines, pretty much say you should treat all ovarian cancer up front with similar uh, treatment, which is usually something called platinum and carbo combination chemotherapy. It, the response rate for clear cell is not as good. So a lot of research is underway right now to look at molecular mechanisms and looking at immune modulators, uh, something called checkpoint inhibitors, um, looking at that ARID1A I was talking about relative to possibly using something called PARP inhibitors. I don't want to get into a whole cancer lexicon of, of treatments available, but your team uh, should include medical and or gynecologic oncologists that are um, savvy about not just here's the standard cocktail for ovarian cancer and, oh, look, it didn't work very well. We know that. So you have to be looking at the next step and you do that by having the cancer um, assessed molecularly. Um, so it's, it's basically... Uh, using very specialized technologies, they look at what's broken molecularly in the cancer and then look for possible targeting agents like this PARP inhibitor I was just talking about on the immune checkpoint inhibitors, et cetera. So uh, all of this has to be done by an expert team. And if that, that none of this sounds familiar, then probably time for a uh, second opinion. Okay, awesome. I'm going to ask you the last question that we receive from patients. Then after that, we can have a closing statement from you. And then, uh, then uh, we can say goodbye to our audience. And the last question is, if you have a confirmed deep infiltrating endometriosis plus family history of both endo and ovarian cancer, what the next steps needs to be? So number one, I would make sure that the pathology was read by a pathologist who is qualified in both endometriosis and cancer. Um, in a center that is otherwise okay for regular care, uh, that doesn't see a lot of that, the pathologist may misdiagnose some things. So you probably ought to get a second opinion of the pathology, which you can request from the pathology department. They'll send it to a, a bigger center. <clears throat> that uh, basically does that kind of thing. Excuse me. Um, genetic counseling, like I said, that ought to be done. That is not only for possible risk that your daughter may have or somebody related to you, your sisters. It also may have a bearing on the treatment that you might receive. Um, imaging, you ought to have at least a baseline ultrasound and MRI at this point to uh, otherwise look at changes. Because otherwise, if you don't have that done now, generally speaking, when you potentially, let's say the, the gynecologist or whoever is following you mm -hmm. feels something and you get an MRI, and then the, MRI, the radiologist says, well, it looks like scar. I'm not sure if it was there before or not. 
when you have a baseline that's post up, you have something to compare to after the surgery. So basically, I would I would get a baseline, possibly run tumor markers depending on what the risk level is, and especially if you've had them before to make sure they're going down to normal. There's um, some additional tests that can be done um, on the tissue that was removed, something called the mitotic index, which is not proven, but it is a easy thing to do. All the pathologist does is look under the microscope and sees if there's any dividing cells. There shouldn't be any in endometriosis. The more um, they see those, uh, and it only takes one really to make it positive, the more it's likely to recur faster or even possibly turn into cancer. Again, this is not a proven notion, but it's an easy test that can give you an idea of uh, <clears throat> the uh, risk pretty much. Um, if you had the surgery done by an expert excisionist, great. If you didn't, probably ought to get an opinion about whether it ought to be all removed as opposed to kind of sort of removed and possibly burned away partially, et cetera. Depending on your family history and possible genetic testing, possibly getting an opinion with a gynecologic oncologist as well to look at that overlap that we were talking about. Uh, and, you know, in the end, uh, to be proactive about it, kind of take a look at your lifestyle. Honestly, I didn't talk about that much, but I'm also an integrative practitioner. And while trying to cure endometriosis or cancer with herbs and so forth is, is a losing proposition. Prevention of a lot of these things does relate to toxin avoidance and making sure your microbiome is working properly and certain herbals, um, certain supplements, mostly diet that's appropriate, lifestyle modifications, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So all of those things are important. Uh, for prevention. And since we don't know the exact connection here, we do know there are molecular overlaps that we talked about with um, endometriosis and cancer, and those are influenced mm -hmm. just like they can be by molecular therapies and, and chemo or whatever, uh, you know, industrial strength therapies. The, uh, all of these factors I just talked about that are proactive mm -hmm. Uh, can also influence that. So it can potentially impact uh, your uh, ability to avoid the cancer. Um, is it, you know, proven? No. Is it cheap? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is something okay. that you just do and you don't have to go out and, and buy a whole bunch of stuff. So anyway, hopefully that's helpful. Very helpful. So <clears throat> Now, I mean, we, we kind of reviewed this article at the beginning and we asked a couple of questions directly related to the, this topic of endometriosis and cancer relationships. And so this, ar this article has made a lot of headlines and a lot of anxiety. A lot of people are talking about this in very like in like 60 seconds or whatever time. Can you explain what will happen after this paper what do you think is going to happen? I know you cannot uh, tell the future, but I want to. I want to know your opinion as an expert leader in this in, the, in this space and in this uh, field. What do you think is going to happen after this paper, knowing the impacts that it has made on the knowledge that we have had about this? Well, I think it uh, will stimulate additional research. I think additional research is already ongoing. Like I said, this isn't a you know. Uh, a bulb going off and something brand new. We've known about this. So this is just adding to the information. It's also not a red flag so that everybody should panic. Uh, this is just a matter of looking again at your own risk factors and situation and asking the appropriate consultants that you're working with, hopefully specialists in endometriosis and possibly oncology as well uh, for, you know, tips, some of which we've been talking about here with respect to what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. So I think the awareness has been raised uh, because it was published in JAMA, which is good. Uh, it could be overinterpreted by causing panic in some mm -hmm. situations, which is not appropriate, mm -hmm. uh, but it shouldn't be, it should also hopefully not be swept under the rug as something that we'll get to. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like 
honestly, smoking for many, many years. We had the data, mm -hmm. but uh, obviously there was industry involved there and all sorts of competing mm -hmm. factors. But uh, we knew for a very, very long time that there was a problem uh, before we actually got people to start, you know, stop smoking basically as a uh, approach to this uh, to prevent lung cancer. So. Uh, again, there are proactive things you can do as well, with or without all this testing. It's at least going to improve your health. Awesome. Dr. Vasilev, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was great. There was a lot of <clears throat> great points for me to learn. After reading that article, I think I needed this discussion. And I'm pretty sure patients are going to find a lot of value from this. Thank you so much for your time. Any last words for the patients and for the audience that are going to listen to this? Well, I'm happy to participate and thanks for inviting me. Um, for those that are trying to uh, avoid something bad like this, mm -hmm. I think we talked about a lot of uh, points here. For those that are already unfortunately afflicted, um, Again, there's there's a lot of new treatments out there, mm -hmm. so you just need to connect with the right team uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that you avail yourselves uh, of of those treatments and not just be satisfied with the basic treatment, which may not work because it's just not targeting this these types of uh, most high risk cancers. Mm -hmm. The most uh, high risk with endo that is. So thank you, and uh, you know. Best wishes yes. to everybody. Thank you. And everybody, if you have any extra questions, please feel free to drop it under this video, wherever you watch this. And uh, we will make sure that Dr. Vasilev sees the questions, maybe responding directly, or we will do another episode based on the question that comes up after this single video. And thank you, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Vasilev. Um, we will be in touch.